Let's go to the Bible and see what the Bible says. Luke chapter 2, if you found that, why don't you stand? We'll read together God's Word. Luke chapter 2. Read this with the children last night from verse 1 down to verse 20. It's the whole account. I'd like to uh, shorten it to verse 8 and read from verse 8 to verse 14. That then is where Luke draws our attention to the shepherds. Luke chapter 2, verse 8 through 14. Grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Let's begin in verse 8. <clears throat> and in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Let's pause there and pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you for the men and women and children, families, singles, that have come to church on a Sunday. What an encouragement it is to my heart. Thank you for that kindness, Lord. Thank you for the grace that we have in Christ. Thank you for the Lord's Day to celebrate the victory that the resurrection guarantees. Now, Holy Spirit of God, I pray that you would draw people, especially those hurting, draw them close. May this be a day when we find our hope and joy in Jesus. We thank you for it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. May be seated. <clears throat> Many of you are readers, and if not readers, you like to go to the movie. Many of you are familiar with the lion and the witch and the wardrobe. The lion, the witch, and the wardrobe is the mythical retelling of Christ. It's a beautiful story written by C.S. Lewis, and anything C.S. Lewis writes, I would recommend to you mere Christianity, abolition of man, all of it, go and read it. But C.S. Lewis sat down to write a mythical retelling of the New Testament and especially of Christ so that children could be introduced to the themes therein. In the story, as C.S. Lewis tells it, Jesus Christ is depicted by the lion named Aslan. Wherever Aslan goes, wherever he goes, life abounds. Aslan lives in a place called Narnia, and it is said in Narnia, if Aslan is not there, it is always winter and never Christmas. Can you imagine? Just think of it. Think of the last couple of days we've had with the weather turned so badly and the cold so bitter. Water pipes bursting and electricity gone and frustration. And think of if, if you went through all of that, if it was always winter and never Christmas. If there was never any real hope, if there were never any strong forgiveness, if there was never any love given, if there was never any joy received? What if we didn't have, what if we didn't have the message of Christmas? What if you walk through the last couple of years of the terrible pain that you've had and you, you walk through it and it's cold and dark all the time, never any, never any love? What if, what if God did not rescue sinners? What if all we actually ever had 
is what this dirty, broken world has to offer. Today's a good day. Today is a good day. Today we have Christmas Day landing on the Lord's Day. Today is a day of salvation. Today is the day when we doubly celebrate the birth of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus all in one day. Today is a day of, of God's, children, God's children remembering and God's children doing our part to show up on this special day and to, to read the story and remember, to hear, to just to hear it, to celebrate the message of Christmas. The message of Christmas, what is that message? That God the Son, who although, this is how Paul says it, who although he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form. Brothers and sisters, that is the story in Luke chapter 2. That's what I read to the children sitting right there last night. It's the beautiful story of the birth of Jesus Christ, and all around that story are these wonderful pictures of God's grace. Let's not ever forget that ours is a religion of grace. It's a message of grace, a message that gives us strength in our sorrow. That gives us hope in our difficulty. That gives us joy. Even as you look into the future. Let's dial in now. We find ourselves in Luke's gospel. We already know the story. We've been following it for the last three weeks with Mary and Joseph. The annunciation of the angel and then the magnificent from Mary Joseph isn't talked about very much except that he is of the house of David that puts him on a trail to Bethlehem. We find them there in Bethlehem. I love Luke's gospel because Luke's gospel is written in such a way that the poor and the lowly and the disenfranchised can, can get a grip on it. In Luke's gospel, the angels, they don't go to the temple. They don't go to the religious people. They show up in a field. Luke's gospel is, is God letting us know that there is indeed a new world coming. A new world where the last is made first and the weak are made strong. A new world where Jesus Christ is Lord. Brothers and sisters, this is grace. And I'll say it like this, there is no grace like Christmas grace. I'm so glad that Christmas Day is on the Lord's Day. Bring them together. We find their grace. Now, I won't keep you long today. <clears throat> I know it's Christmas Day. But I just have a couple of words. I'll make it a two-point sermon this morning. And in fact, I'll make it a two-word sermon. Now, I'm going to talk about those words, but two words. And the first word that you have there is the word hope. The word hope. Look, if you, do, if you can just get a grain of hope, if you could just get a little bit of hope, if, if hope can dig into your heart, dig into your soul, there is nothing coming your way 2023 that you can't face. Let me show you what I mean. Let's go there in verse 8. Notice um, that's where the action starts in verse 8. Join me there. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. A key word is shepherds. Shepherds? Are you kidding me? Anybody but shepherds. Why not the priests or the scribes or the Pharisees or, or even the Sadducees? They're legalistic, but at least they know the law. Why the shepherds? It would have been... Anybody I would have chosen but the shepherds. At this time in history where we find the birth of Jesus, shepherds were socially outcast. They're ceremonially unclean. They are morally suspect. You can't trust them in a court of law. 
They were not by anybody's definition, they were not by anybody's definition solid citizens. Of all the millions of people that the angels could have come to on that day, of all the religious people in Israel, Jerusalem's just down the road. You know who God chose? You know who God chose? You know what grace means? That God chooses the outcast, the unclean, the reprobate, the bottom dwellers. He did that now. He did that for a reason. Do you understand grace? There's a principle down in there somewhere. You've got to dig around a little bit. There's a principle down in there when you think about the shepherds. Now, this story is certainly about the birth of Jesus, but all around the birth of Jesus are these pictures of grace, and one such picture is the shepherds. It's good to remember when you think about the shepherds, it's good to remember what James said. What did James say in James chapter 2, verse 5? James said, has, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which, has, which he has promised to those who love him? Think about it now. Think about how our God works. Think about the people that God uses in the Bible. Think about Abraham. He was a pagan before God came to him and chose him. Think about Moses. Moses was working for his father-in-law, and God came after him. Think about Gideon threshing wheat in a wine press. Think about Elijah behind a plow. Think about David. He was a shepherd. I say all of that and point it out to you on Christmas morning to remind you we to remind you of the overwhelming beauty of grace. It shows us God's grace. Grace means that, that you are saved not by anything that you've done, not by any religious activity, not by being a good person, not by showing up at church on a Sunday, and my goodness, Christmas Sunday. Look, if you are a Christian sitting here today, and I hope you are, if you are a Christian, you are saved by God's grace given to you through your faith in Jesus. And you are saved in spite of your sin. Christmas is a reminder, if God would show up to shepherds, certainly he will you. The shepherds, not only were they outcasts, their work kept them away from temple. They weren't at worship. Weeks and months on end, certainly they could have been Jewish by birth, but you know how that is. You're not necessarily by their own choice. They might have believed in some concept of God. Here's the message in the text. Here's the message. What's the message of the story? So the center message is Jesus comes into the world, right. But, but what about the shepherds? Why are they there? This is why. Because God doesn't call the upright and the religious God calls sinners and adulterers. God calls liars and atheists. God calls unbelievers. God calls, God calls hypocrites. God calls the materialistic. God calls sinners. God called a man like me and a person like you. And he does that. Why does he do that? He does that. For a reason. The, the reason we see these shepherds, why does God choose shepherds? Paul knew. Paul said it like this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 28 and 29. He tells us that God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. We, we come and worship today because we are products of God's grace, not to show how religious we are. We come because we thank God that he saved us from hell. Listen, God came to shepherds. And the message is clear. The Christmas message is clear. It's a crystal clear message. God has come to you this morning with all of your issues and all of your hang-ups and with your sin and pride and secrets 
and he comes to you offering life and hope in Christ. How does that happen? Let me just, let me just give the gospel on a Christmas morning. Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, fully God and fully man. His life is not like ours. He certainly was tempted, but tempted without sin. He was, he was able to fight that off. He did that as the perfect man. The first Adam fell into sin. The second Adam, Jesus Christ, he resisted and lived perfectly as, as people are supposed to. Jesus was the only one who ever did it. He comes into this world and, and lives perfectly in such a way that the righteousness he earns is ours, but there's something that has to happen. Our sin has to be punished. That punishment is doled out on Jesus at the cross. That's why the cross, if you're new to coming to church or being a Christian, why we have the cross is that at the cross, Jesus takes our sin and gives us that righteousness. There's the gospel, and the way it saves you Okay, that's happened in time and history. The way that applies to you is when you say, I can't do it myself. I am a sinner. You mean somebody died in my place? Yes, I'll put my faith in that one. And when you believe that Jesus died for you, God comes and saves you. That's how you become a Christian. That's how you receive grace. And that's when hope begins. And if you can have just a little bit of hope this year, if you can have hope in Christ, God is going to use that to carry you through. It's the first word. first word is hope. I'd like to give you a second word. And the second word is joy joy. I want you to have a deep and abiding joy. I want you to know what joy is. I don't want you just to be happy all the time. I'm glad for you to be happy. That's not my main concern. I want you to, I want you to have joy in the Lord. When I, when I pray for friends, when I pray for you, I pray the, that the joy of the Lord would be your strength. When I pray for Connie, I pray she would flourish as a Christian woman and that she would have deep joy. I want you to know joy. Let's not forget that when Christ comes to save us, he comes and brings joy. So, so when I say joy, I mean a deep and abiding joy, a foundational joy, a, a, a sustaining joy, because life is hard. And you just came off a hard 2022, maybe a hard two years, or Christmas time is hard. I want you to have that joy, a, a forgiving joy, a, a sustaining joy, a, a joy that's going to wash over and heal your soul and make it so that you can walk with confidence it's a joy found in the gospel. This is our religion. It's one of joy. Let's, let's pick up the story in the text in verse 9. Join me there in verse 9. <clears throat> and notice what verse 9 tells us. Let me read it. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. So get the picture now. I love that little phrase, verse 9, filled with great fear. Fear. If you read the King James, the King James says that they were sore afraid. That they were so afraid, it made them sore the next day, like they worked out. The, the Greek literally says that they feared a great fear. You might say it like this, it scared them to death. Get the picture now, they are, they are minding their own business. An angel shows up, and in verse 10... In verse 10, the angel starts to give them the gospel. Don't lose the gospel now. In verse 10, there it is. What does the text say? <clears throat> verse 10, And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, here's the gospel, I bring you good news, great joy for all people. What is the gospel? That for all people, God has brought Great joy that is centered in the good news of Jesus. Don't let, it get, don't let it get lost. Don't let it get lost. That for all people, regardless of age or 
sex or background or race or stature for all people, regardless of past, regardless of where you've been, regardless of who you are, regardless of who you are now. The gospel is for all people. But to put that into perspective, let's back up for a moment and, and, notice, and notice where this is coming from. Let's make sure we have a good understanding here on Christmas morning. I know, I know you're ready to get back. Let's give you a good understanding. What is the Bible about? The Bible from Genesis chapter 1 and 2 is about a holy God. A holy God that created men and women. Adam and Eve did so in his image. And there they are in a perfect place. How it happens, I don't know how it happens. Sin has entered somehow. Genesis 2, they fall into sin, and the rest of the Bible is about this good and holy God pursuing sinners like us. And the story of Luke chapter 2 is God finally breaking in. Look, there are people in this room right now. I know it's Christmas morning. There are people that, are, that, are, that are, have some sort of addiction you're wrestling with. You, you've sinned in such a way that if you, if you let that sin keep going like it is and left unchecked, then you're going to live your life with hang-ups and insecurity and no joy, with nothing to hold on to, nothing to help you, nothing to save you. And this story is not that. That's bad news. This story is good news. This story is, is, is grace. This is about Jesus Christ, the, the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, Him taking on flesh like me and you and doing what you couldn't do. Living perfectly, dying on the cross in the place of sinners as a substitute, God takes the punishment you and I deserve, places it on Jesus, and gives us forgiveness. Do you know you are forgiven? Do you, do you just think sometimes of forgiveness? I am forgiven. I, I want you to hear at Christmas time, if you are in Christ, you have sinned terribly. In Christ, God forgives you. This story is about grace. There, there's a beautiful um, ascending crescendo in verses 11 and 12 and 13 and, and 14. Uh, let's just read it. Let's, let me read it and I'll come back and talk about it. Let's read it. Verse Verse 11. <clears throat> This is what the angel is saying to the shepherds. So there's one angel, an angel has appeared, scared them to death, and he starts talking, verse 11, this is what the angel says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And after he said that, something happens. And suddenly... There was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Now, now all right, we read through it. Go back, verse 11. Go back there. Go back and look at the title in verse 11. You see at the very end of verse 11, he is a Savior, Christ the Lord. Think about the titles, Savior, Christ the Lord. Joseph knows his name. The shepherds don't. What they know is there are titles. When you go and read the Old Testament and all of the prophecies, there are titles. We love the prophecy from Isaiah when Isaiah tells us he is a wonderful counselor and mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. They're titles. And you bring the two together from Isaiah and Luke and you find out that the wonderful counselor is our Savior. That this mighty God is Christ. That the everlasting Father is the Lord. That the Prince of Peace is the baby in the manger. And, and when this news is announced, so that's verse 11 and verse 12, when this news is announced, watch what happens in verse 13. And suddenly... There was with that angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God. Now think about what happened. 
One angel is giving them the news. He's telling the shepherds, this is what's going to happen. He's laying it out for them. And as he starts revealing this good news, it's as if all the rest of the angels in heaven couldn't, they couldn't hold back. They had never heard this before. So the text says that a multitude shows up, not 50 or 150, not 1,500, 15,000, 150,000, 150 billion angels. I don't know if that's the number or not. Emptied out. All of heaven is empty because all those angels heard what they've been waiting on. And this multitude of the heavenly host, beyond count, all of these angels that will fight the war of Armageddon and Revelation, all these angels that have been waiting for God to reveal how he's going to solve the problem of human sin, they now are hearing the most amazing thing. They've been alive for thousands of years waiting on this message, the most amazing thing. John Milton, John Milton wrote uh, Paradise Lost. John Milton looked at this passage and of the angels, he said, the, the helmeted cherubim, the sordid seraphim, the in glittering ranks with wings displayed, the stars with deep amaze, they stand, stand firm in steadfast gaze. Here's an army of angels who are designed to war. They're hearing peace. Bishop J.C. Uh, J. Ryle, the frank and manly J.C. Ryle, a, an Anglican pastor from another age, he he spoke of this, and he wondered out loud, and I wonder as well, what were the angels? Why were they there? What made them want to hear this message? Why did the angels rejoice and break off in verse 14 in this, this worshipful song? J.C. Ryle says that, well, one reason could be that the way, of, the way of pardon and peace with God is about to be thrown open to all mankind. It could be the promise from Genesis 3 that the head of Satan is about to be bruised, that liberty is going to be preached to all the slaves, blind people are going to get their sight, captives are about to be set free. The angels knew that the truth of the gospel is going to be proclaimed that God is the judge. He is a wrathful God. Yes, he's a wrathful God, but God can be just and be the justifier. that the angels knew the very first stone of God's fortress, the chief cornerstone, Jesus, is going to be laid. And these are good tidings of great joy. Look at their song. This ought to be our song. Look at their song in verse 14. Glory to God in the highest. So glory goes up. This is worship. Glory to God in the highest, what comes down, peace. Glory, worship goes up, what happens to us, peace. There's reconciliation. The grace of God. The grace of God that is found only in the Christ we worship. And the song in verse 14, that's what we do. That's why we came to church today. Because through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, we can worship and give glory to God. And as we do, it floods our souls. It's peace. It's reconciliation with God that happens at the cross of Christ. Brothers and sisters, there is really no, no grace like Christmas grace. And it's found in Christ alone. Two words from this passage are hope and joy. I want you to have, as your brother in Christ and as a pastor and a friend, look, I want you to be centered on the hope that is found in Jesus. I want you to have hope this year. But on top of that word hope, I, I really, I want you to have the joy that, that will strengthen your heart, settle your mind, and carry you through the next year a joy that is found in Jesus Christ. In a few moments, we're going to sing the last song for this worship service. And 
And as we sing it, I want you to sing with joy because you have hope in Christ. And as I pray this final prayer, I want to pray for you that God would give you a great hope and joy in the Lord Jesus. Do you join me as we pray together? Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would draw men and women close to yourself today, that you would heal the brokenhearted. God, I pray for every person that here is depressed from the year behind. God, I pray that you supernaturally in the name of Jesus, would replace that with joy, even a seed of joy, even a small fleck of hope. I pray that you would bring that. That hope is ours in Jesus, and I pray, Lord, that you would give it to your children here today. I pray for men and women here that are familiar with the church and maybe even a religious, might even think they're Christians and yet are dead inside. Father, would you take this gospel spark, this hope, would you, would you ignite in them a faith in Jesus Christ, his life, death, and resurrection. Thank you. Thank you for Sunday. Thank you for Christmas. Thank you for hope and joy and grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand, please, as we sing together? <clears throat>